Okay. I'm Pamela Meredith. I chair the space law practice group at KMA Zuckert here in Washington, DC. And I am going to talk about the law and on orbit servicing. Now it's good in a way that you put the law at the end because that gives me an excuse or an opportunity, I suppose, to say that the law should never be an afterthought in any space venture. And why is that? One reason is that this whole space sector is highly regulated. Space activities require licensing and it's important to ascertain early in the project what kinds of licenses are needed and the timeline for getting them. The second reason is that these ventures, space ventures are inherently risky and it's important to have a risk management strategy early on. And in our case, we are talking about legal tools for mitigating financial risk of damage and mission failure. And we're gonna come back to that. But let me start with the regulatory portion first. There are several approvals required for a satellite servicing operation or an on-orbit servicing operation. I'm gonna use them synonymously. First, the FCC license. An FCC license will definitely be required for an on-orbit servicing operation. It will be required to deploy and operate the vehicle, including proximity operations, rendezvous and proximity operations, docking, undocking, grappling, and so forth. Now, why does the FCC get into this? The FCC gets into this because satellite servicing involves using radio spectrum. Any operation of this sort will need to use radio spectrum, communicate. And the FCC decided back in, two th in 1970, my, it's a long time ago already, in 1970 that a satellite is a radio station and satellite communication is radio communications. And it's precisely radio communications and radio stations that the FCC regulates. So therefore, satellite servicing would come squarely under their licensing purview to the extent communications are being used or the spectrum is being used. So that's the FCC license. Now, interestingly, the FCC has just recently introduced a new requirement, new regulatory requirement that goes specifically to satellite servicing. It now requires that satellite applicants that are planning proximity or rendezvous or proximity operations, docking and so forth, explain in the satellite application how they will address orbital debris issues such as collision or debris release, accidental or planned during those operations. So that's a new requirement introduced in the, or in the orbital debris mitigation order adopted in April of this year. The requirement is not yet in force, but it will be shortly when that order is published in the Federal Register. The customer will also likely need a, an authorization from the FCC, for example, to raise the orbit or share its frequencies or, or the like. So we're talking two authorizations required in this case. Again, the FCC has authority also to determine the location of a radio station. 
also something to think about, which gives them some added authority here uh, that they can use in this context. NOAA license. Yes, satellite servicing would typically require a NOAA license. And why is that? Because the new NOAA regulations of May 2020 require that the uh, anyone in orbit, even if they are not, or even if they're engaged in non-Earth orbiting, so as long as you have a sensor capable, and capable is the operative word, of sensing the Earth's surface, uh, a license is required. So again, if your sensor is capable of remote sensing, Remote sensing being defined as the sensor output can, can be uh, processed into imagery showing the surface features of the Earth. Then you need a remote sensing license. And NOAA has said that that's likely to be the case anytime you have a sensor on an object in Earth orbit, even if it's not, uh, has, even if its mission is not to sense the surface of the Earth. NOAA's new regulations, again, on May of this year, also introduces a new requirement for consent to sensing other satellites in certain cases, so that's something to be aware of. Prior consent of the sensed, uh, of the operator of the sensed object. The two licenses I talked about so far relate to US satellite service operators. Now, if you're a foreign satellite service operator, and you're launching on an FAA licensed launch vehicle, the FAA will perform a payload review of your satellite or your, your service vehicle. And if they determine that the launch of that satellite service object or vehicle uh, may jeopardize the safety of property on orbit or the international um, obligations or foreign policy interests or national security interests of the United States, it has the authority to prevent that launch. So that's something to be aware of if you are a foreign licensed uh, satellite service operator. Finally, on the regulatory side, we are, we have ITAR. Satellite servicing, if the, if the technology is, is US, uh, to export that technology to a foreign customer, in other words, to discuss satellite servicing and docking technology with a foreign customer, you would need a, a, a TAA approval, so a technical assistance agreement. That is because uh, satellite servicing is, uh, or satellite servicing satellites are on the munitions list, and you would then be technical data uh, in the technical data uh, area for that. Um, once you have technical discussions with your customer. That was the regulatory portion. Let me now move to risk management. Again, we were talking about or are talking about using legal tools to minimize financial consequences of damage to property and mission failure. So what are those legal tools? There are three 
One is transfer the risk to another party in the contract. The other is insurance. And the third is a calculated decision to assume the risk. So those are the three legal tools. So let's put those to practice, starting with damage. Damage to your own as a satellite service operator, damage to your own vehicle. Unreasonable to think that you can transfer the risk of that damage to your customer. That is a risk that you need to bear. Now, how do you protect yourself then um, from financial loss, from damage to your vehicle? Well, you can take out insurance. Insurance, of course, for the launch is pretty standard. That would be any standard launch insurance policy. The operations in orbit, that's a different story. That would require a customized policy that would have to be negotiated carefully. And you would likely be subject to conditions, restrictions, and potentially exclusions for certain elements of that coverage. So that again is for damage to the service vehicle itself. Now, what about damage to the satellite of the customer? Ideally, from the satellite service operator's point of view, there should be a waiver of liability in the contract. The waiver of liability saying, I will not sue you, customer, and you will not sue me, meaning, the customer will not sue the service vehicle operator. So there'd be no claims going back and forth and each party will assume the risk of loss or damage to their vehicles. In that case, each party will ensure as they see fit. If the satellite operator is already carries insurance for the on-orbit operation. This, of course, would be a material change in that policy and would require notification to the underwriters and, and negotiation of additional coverage. Um, or the parties can fashion an insurance solution together and there are ways of, of doing that. So um, that's damage to the customer satellite. Let's talk about the third type of damage, which is to third party satellites. Here we're talking about all the other satellites out there in the orbit. What if one of those satellites is damaged by debris released accidentally um, from the uh, uh, docking or God forbid a collision on docking? Um, in that case, the satellite customer would want to be indemnified against any claims from third parties. That's not an unreasonable request, uh, but an indemnification may not be worth much if a com company goes out of business or can't pay because the damage could be pretty sizable. So to protect itself further, the satellite customer would require that the, the vehicle, the service vehicle operator take out third party liability insurance and add the customer as an additional insured on that policy. Again, indemnification, take out insurance and add the customer as an additional insured. Those are three things contractually that the um, customer will likely require. But keep in mind, and that's what I was going to say, that the insurance coverage will have limits. And that limit will be such that any catastrophic damage from a cascading effect in orbit where tens and tens of satellites are damaged, um, that insurance will not cover. 
And that brings me to the international track of this third party liability insurance. The US government, if there is a US satellite service operator, the US government um, will be liable under treaties in the event of fault and only in the event of fault on the part of the satellite service operator. So there is international treaty liability. As of today, there is no requirement to indemnify the US government for such liability. The FCC is discussing that and also imposing insurance, not specifically in the context of satellite servicing, but generally that is happening in the orbital debris NPRM that was just notice of proposed rulemaking that was just released in, in April of this year. Finally, negotiating all these types of contracts, it's very important to have a solid limitation of liability clause, disclaimer of warranty, uh, limitation on liability, no consequential damages, cap on liability, and a sole remedy provision. All these are very important legal tools for protection for any satellite service operator. Thank you for listening. Any questions, I'm happy to answer later. Take care.